Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you had a great weekend. Very excited to share the episode that we have for you today, speaking with Joanna Penn from The Creative Pen. And there's a few of these interviews that we have teed up that we're releasing on our normal cadence because they are so timely. To set a frame for this, I've just seen a, a series of ridiculously titled articles on news outlets and blogs, <laughs> one notably on CNBC titled Self-Made Millionaire Says the Concept of Retiring Early Will Disappear Due to the Coronavirus Pandemic. Okay. Uh, variations to that basically saying, is the financial independence movement over? Come on, people. Seriously. You don't need to be worried about us, right? Just, just play this out with me. The financial independence movement is not happening in the absence of a financial crisis. It was born out of the 2008 financial crisis. In 2008, people's lives were ripped away from them. Everything that they thought they could count on, their secure job, their stable income, their paycheck to paycheck lifestyle, it was ripped away. And out of that pain, people said never again. And what started as a subcult of people realizing that it's just simple math and optimizing at the margins, slowly became a movement as we were increasingly able to share ideas. You don't need to be worried about people that found this three or four or five years ago. They're great, right? It's not binary, fi or not fi. People that have paid down their consumer debt, people that have, people that have cut discretionary spending, focused on what it is they value and put massive savings aside for years, Look, there's no free pass. Everybody is concerned about this, but you don't need to be worried about the people that have savings. You don't need to be worried about the people that set money aside when times were good. They're going to be okay. But now what we're finding is this is a unique opportunity because the next generation effectively is having this wake up call. What they thought was guaranteed that secure job has been ripped away as seen by the unemployment numbers this past week. And hopefully it all comes back quickly, but Right now, more so than at any point over the past 10 years, individuals are saying, I need to get some financial resiliency in my life. And people that were on the YOLO bandwagon, on the Instagram, Pinterest, perfect lifestyle bandwagon, suddenly you're like, you know what's most important that I can provide for myself and my family. Those individuals are now looking for great resources. They're open to having those conversations and you as someone on the path to financial independence is uniquely positioned to start having those conversations and there's silver linings, even in the darkest of days. I hope what this episode does for you is share how Joanna Penn through the 2008 financial crisis uses an opportunity to go in a completely different direction. So with that, Brad and I are really looking forward to sharing this episode with you. Welcome to Choose FI. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. everyone very excited about this particular episode we're getting the opportunity to speak with joanna penn from the creative pen with double n's the context for this being joanna penn has really become an ambassador for the independent writer in fact she's kind of been leading on the charge on this for really almost close to the past decade now and in the process she has created a safe space for writers that are looking to branch out on their own flex their creative muscles and figure out is this something that you could take from maybe just a side hustle or a dream and actually turn it into a viable living where you don't have to worry about being a starving artist. In fact, Joanna's story is so compelling. She actually walked away from a six-figure job and took a massive pay dip and was able to rebuild her income over time using some of the tactics and techniques that we're going to be talking about on the show today. And I hope what we can do is give you some actionable tips if you've ever thought about pursuing a career in writing and take away some of the fear that might 
come along with that? Uh, do I have to wait till I've reached financial independence in order to pursue that? And all the list of things that can come through her years of experience in this industry to help me with this. I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I'm doing quite well. Yeah, I've been really looking forward to this. I had the good fortune of meeting Joanna when I was interviewed on her podcast, actually, a couple months ago. It's neat to find out that she is this highly, highly successful independent author, and she has followed the Phi path. I mean, she is truly a member of the Phi community. And to see her leave this high-paying job and get the benefits of Phi long before she was there, that's part of the beautiful journey that she's undertaken. And the cool thing here is we have the third member of our podcast team, MK, on the show. Because MK is, as we know, an independent author. She is a huge fan of Joanna. She's listened to her for years. And we thought there's nobody better to help us interview Joanna than MK. So MK, thanks for being here. Yeah. Thanks for letting me be part of this interview. I love it when my worlds collide, my worlds of writing and independent publishing and FI. And that was initially when I decided I needed a break from all the FI podcasts because that was my whole life. I was like, I wonder if there's podcasts about books or for writing. Oh my gosh, I could be learning more. And that's when I found Joanna's podcast. And as I was listening over the years, she would say things about the financial aspect of being an author. And I would think, I wonder, I wonder if we should subtly try to get her into the five movement. And I was listening to her on the unemployable podcast, which amazing name for a podcast, by the way. And she said something about the five movement. And I was sitting next to my husband, Jason, and I paused it and I was like, Joanna Penn knows about Phi. Like, this is it. (laughs) (laughs) My worlds are together. And from there, that was how we were able to get you in touch with her, Brad. And it was just this beautiful moment where I was like, oh, the universe is right. (laughs) Everything's coming together. (laughs) Well, that is awesome. So with that, Joanna, welcome to the Choose a Phi podcast. Oh, thanks so much for having me on the show. I'm super excited to be here as well. And, you know, I love what you guys are doing. And people have been asking me to do more on financial independence. And I'm like, no, just go over to Choose FI. <laughs> Perfect. That's awesome. Well, you, exactly what we want to do today is talk more about writing and, and specifically leveraging the powers of financial independence long before you reach some maybe binary number. You're there, you're not there. You know, you get that it's a continuum, right? And I think what we see, the power of this for, for creatives, I think, all of us, humanity was born to create, not just to assemble widgets. And if you can realize that not just in your golden years and beyond, but really in your best years, that's inspiring. And to see people that have done it, make it easier for the rest of us that didn't have that much courage right out the gate. So could you give us a sense, what gave you the courage to try this? Well, (laughs) uh, in terms of writing, I think I've always been a writer in that those people on the video can kind of see behind me, I've got loads of journals. I've been journaling since I was about 15, you know, those angst teenage years. But I thought of authors as sort of somehow a separate group of beings that I could never be like that. So I went to university, did the degree like you do, got the debt, (laughs) not as bad as you guys, but um, got a job in consulting. Uh, I was at Accenture and companies like I BM, that kind of high paying corporate job. But I got to my early 30s and I was just crying. I was so miserable. I was thought I'd done what everybody said you should do, you know, get the proper job, pay the bills, you know, buy the investment property, do all those things. And but I, I was so miserable. It felt like part of me had died because I just wasn't being creative. I guess I never thought I was creative. (laughs) This is the odd thing. Mm. But then I got to that point where, you know, my wonderful husband said, you need to do something else. You know, what is it? So I was like, do you know what? I love reading. I just read all the time. Such a big reader. And I thought, well, maybe I can write a book about career change. And in writing that book, I can change my own life and hopefully sell the book, make millions, retire. And that was the year, amusingly, Tim Ferriss came out with the four hour work week. (laughs) So I wrote what I thought was going to be this this great book. And then Tim Ferriss did the thing. But that book changed my life because even though it didn't sell much and it kind of never even went anywhere, it changed my life because I learned about writing and publishing. And that was sort of 2007. So that's the point at which I just did it. So the fear was all the usual fear of failure, fear of nobody buying it, you know, maybe even fear of success in some way. But I was literally at the point in my life where I was just too miserable and I had to do something. And amusingly, what I discovered was publishing. Joanna, you said in there, I guess I never thought I was creative. And that just jumped out to me. You had this angst, right? You had done everything right. 
you had this high paying job, you checked all the boxes of things that people told you to do to be happy and successful, but yet you weren't. But I'm not certain based on the fact that you're saying, I guess I never thought I was creative, that you knew what the next path was or you knew what the way out was. How did you explore that? Was this Mm -hmm. something you undertook in some manner? Did you have conversations with family, friends? Talk me through how that process worked because that inflection point is really important for millions of other people who are stuck as well. Okay, well, I think I have a bias for action. That is a good and bad part of my personality. (laughs) So this had been going on for a while. So literally, I tried lots of things. I started a scuba diving business in New Zealand. I I was a scuba diving instructor. I worked with, uh, at the time, was my first husband. And we hired a boat and we did all the stuff. And I learned all the things about variable income and variable costs like fuel and the weather and people and insurance. Like people do not start a scuba diving business. (laughs) This is really a bad idea. So I did that and I thought, oh, well, that business failed. I'm going to be a failure. You know, that was my first attempt at a proper business. Business and I learned all the things I never wanted to do again. Then I got into this was, you know, I read Kiyosaki, I got into property investment, and I discovered I really just don't care what the color of the carpet is. I don't care about buying paint in bulk. I just did not care about that stuff. And so that also taught me that I did not want to be in property. Uh, I wanted to be location independent. And so by doing these failures in inverted commas, what I learned was what I might want to do. And every time those things failed, I went back to the day job. So I was implementing accounts payable into large corporates, which let's face it, is just not creative. So you can see the pattern. I wanted to start a business. I wanted to make money doing other things. As Kiyosaki said, you can't get rich being an employee unless, of course, you invest lots (laughs) for all those people who are employees. But what I learned was, okay, I want to be physically uh, location independent. I don't want physical assets. I want to do intellectual property assets. I want to be creative. I want to travel, but, you know, I don't necessarily want to do it doing helping other people scuba dive. So all those things together meant that I kind of zigzagged. And the metaphor I use is it's a bit like skiing. If you want to go down the hill, you don't just point the skis and head straight in the straight direction. You have to start moving and then you have to zigzag along the way and kind of go, okay, well, I lean into this and then, oh, I don't want that. I'll lean away from that and lean into something else. So the bias for action thing, it probably, it took me between Well, the year 2000 was the first time I resigned. I left England to go to uh, traveling around Australia and New Zealand. And then I just kept resigning, kept starting businesses, resigning. And then eventually in 2006 was when I started writing and discovered the publishing industry. So it definitely wasn't, oh, hey, I'm miserable. I write a book and then it's all sorted. There was definitely some trial and error along the way. Yeah. Trial and error, bias for action. And how do you know what flavor of ice cream you're going to like? Well, you got to try them. You got to try it all. And so there's a lot built in there that we can explore. I, I want to set up for people that assuming that this, this statistic is accurate that I read on your website, as of this point, you have published 30 books with over a half million copies sold. I mean, that, that, that's incredible. So just to talk about going from scuba diving to now writing your first book, I just want to know that first year, you know, that you wrote this book, how many copies sold that first year? Joanna Penn, nobody knows who she is. She's just doing it. Bias for action, done. How many copies sold that first year? I sold about 100 copies of my first book, but I want to tell you how bad it really was because this was back in the day when self-publishing was print some books, put them in your garage and then sell them. This was before the Kindle, before all of this. So I printed 2,000 books oh. <laughs> and had them in my garage. I was like, yay, I'm going to sell them all. I'm going to like, but the crazy thing was this, I was living in Australia. I got on national TV. I got in the national uh, newspapers. I got on the radio. I had the media, but I wasn't in bookstores because I was independent and there was no online sale. So I couldn't shift the books. But this is what led me into podcasting, because what happened was I was like, well, traditional media, what is the point? And then I saw what was going on in America. I was like, how do I reach those Americans? And so that's when I started podcasting and blogging. So the point is, every failure led me 
into making a decision. It's almost like that failed, that hurt. What should I do so that that won't happen again? And what are the lessons I can learn? So I, I don't use the word failure. You know, I'm putting that inverted commas if you're just on the audio. It's like you just have to have that feeling of, OK, I won't do that again. But I do have this one brilliant photo of me standing next to these boxes. <laughs> and the look on my face, MK's seen the picture, obviously. The, the look on my face is, oh, I'm so proud of myself. Look at all these books. And it's about three hours before I realized that I had to sell them. <laughs> <laughs> Can I actually ask you, I want to, all right. So I want to actually go back to a statement that you just kind of embedded in there. Uh, I, I do think that many people that are starting out writing, writing their first book, assume that what is going to be able to set them apart, allow them to change, you know, to have massive reach, massive access is a traditional publisher seeing how awesome this book is and spreading it around the world. So you said traditional media, what's the point? Add some context or some flavor to what that statement meant for you as an unknown author. Yes. Yeah, so again, it's that kind of bias for action. When I wrote the book and then I looked at the publishing industry and I didn't know anything about it, I was like, oh, agents, publishers, bookstores, you know, I bought books, but I didn't really understand how they got there. And I discovered it would probably take six months to a year to get an agent. It would take six months to a year, maybe more to, for the books to get on the bookshelves. And then I would have to do exactly what I was doing anyway, which was kind of going on the TV and the radio and newspaper and doing all this stuff. So I was like, well, I don't want to wait that long. I want to do this now. I have this book ready now. I was also seeing in the space, this was the years of copy blogger Brian Clark and Yaris Starak, Entrepreneur's Journey. And I saw people who were making a living online. What I realized was what well, I could wait and use my energy to chase a deal, or I could use my energy to get out there and build my platform. And to be fair, if you want a traditional publishing deal, and I certainly don't have anything against fantastic publishers, of which there are many, is that if you have a platform, if you have a podcast, if you have an audience already, the publishers will be far more interested anyway. So once I learned that, I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll just get on with it. And I really like writing, so I'm going to write more books. So it was kind of a decision to do it myself rather than wait all that time. And also uh, just a decision that this was my chosen career and I was going to build my own platform and eventually the publishers would come to me. The funny thing is with publishing, by the time you get to the point where the publishers come to you, you're in a position where you don't necessarily <laughs> need that. Anyway, I have done lots of deals with various publishers for foreign rights, but nowadays you can pretty much do everything yourself. So I've sold books in 136 countries now. So, you know, you can do all this stuff. So what I definitely hear in that is a reflection of what I've experienced and what I've seen other authors experience where we know that there's this gatekeeper, there's this, the way it's supposed to be, air quotes, and then we give ourselves permission to do the research, to say, no, I can do this. It's hard work, but I'm going to do it. And that relates to how people view the FI journey. Like who's going to give you permission to say you can be financially independent? Like Nobody does that. Well, I'm giving myself permission. I did the research. And that goes with any creative endeavor, starting a podcast, writing a book, deciding to go out on your own and start your own business. And I think that is something that is so validating to hear that you know, you've been doing this for years and that it's not this new concept that's come around. You know, giving yourself that permission is one of the biggest things that can change your life because then you can take the action that really changes it. Yeah. And that bias for action is so important. You said that failed, that hurt, what can I do to make sure that doesn't happen again? And that is brilliant. I really want to make sure the audience heard that because I think a lot of people get this kind of grand idea. Okay, I'm thinking about doing something. I'd love to run a business online. And then they kind of putter around trying to get a logo for six months. And, you know, maybe they get around to the first uh, blog article or something. And, and it all sounds good in theory, but they don't have that bias for action. I'm, I'm curious, do you see people in the independent author area do similar stuff? And how do you counsel them to basically have that major bias for action? I think that the people I see are at a couple of levels. There are people who have come out of failure in the traditional publishing world. So maybe they've been pitching and no one has picked up their book. And those people are quite downtrodden. Then there are those people who actively choose to be independent. And that's why I also equate, you know, I really love the FI movement because independence is what I, you know, I'm an independent. 
I publish across multiple platforms, so I'm not dependent on Amazon, for example. I have multiple streams of income, so I am independent. And should one stream fail, another stream will come into play. So this in idea of independence, to me, this is a positive choice. So what I would say to people, it's not like, oh, I can't get published, so I'll self-publish. That's not it at all. I'm an independent author which means I actively choose my independence. I can publish when and what and where I like. And my validation is in my readers. It's in the money in my bank account. It's in it's in how I feel. Now, of course, I have down days. <laughs> I have a whole book about the author mindset, which is like, I'm miserable. Everything is bad. My writing is terrible. I get that too. But the validation of independence to me is choice. It's all the things that you guys stand for. And that's exactly the same in publishing. What, what drives me nuts is when I see people like they, they're so independent in one way and then they still go begging like, oh, pick me, pick me. And that's not what we're here for. So I want to actually talk about your economic story arc as a writer. I mean, in particular, that you didn't wait until you left your job to start writing. That bias fraction got you to start practicing and cultivating this skill set. And that was maybe built on years and years of journaling. And you, I, it sounds like you published this book while you were still working, but at some point, either forced or unforced, you went off on your own. I kind of want to work through that inflection point because I think for our audience, individuals that are maybe waiting, waiting to get started, right? Well, one day the finances will be right. One day the bank account will be right. One day, one day, and it never happens, right? So how, for you, that actual, from an echo, you said I got validation. I get validation from my bank account. I love it, by the way. <laughs> but let's just talk about early days when you've you've just printed 2000 books and you sold 100, you know, how did you have the courage to do this then? What what was going on in the background? Yes. So basically I had a day job and this is the number one thing. Okay. So the other times, like I quit my job to go do other things like scuba diving. And this, this time I was like, no way I'm going to build this up. So I wrote that first book. I started my blog. I started my podcast. 2000, so this is 2006, seven, eight, nine. And I started to see that I could make these different forms of income. So I didn't just do books. So from day one, I had multiple streams of income. At the time I was professional speaking. I was building up a speaking career. I still had my day job. So up until 2011, I did eventually go to four days a week. But basically, I was getting up at 5am. I was writing, doing the creative stuff. In the evening, I was podcasting. I was doing my blog. I was building my audience. I was on Twitter. I was doing all the things you do. <laughs> and I was running workshops at weekends. I was basically building up the side hustle as it's now known. It wasn't really known that at the time. Then 2011, we moved back to the UK from Australia. I did start another job here in London. At, well, I'm in Bath now, but I was in London. And again, I was so miserable. It was at that point, I was making around a thousand US a month from the business. Now, I was used to a lot more than that in my salary. So I said to my husband, we could downsize if we sold our property, if we sold the investment property. And then I had, you know, six months to a year in the bank. And I was the prime wage earner at the time. So if we did that and that money was available and I committed to six months to a year of doing this business, if it didn't work, I can just go back to the day job. So that was going to be the plan. And he was like, yep, all right, let's do it. And this is, I know you guys talk about financial intimacy and talking about things like this with your partner. So I said, right, we're going to do this. So we did, we sold everything and really downsized. And it was, I tell you what, that really hit my self-esteem. I went from being the top of my career to feeling like really crap <laughs> without without saying any bad words i was i was rock bottom that first year is super hard i lost my friends and nobody knew who i was in the writer business really it was very hard but what happened that year i think if you white knuckle the first 6 months and you have that money in reserve and you don't have the outgoings so we didn't have all the you know mortgage payments and all of that then after the year it started to look up so um, 2012, and then it was 2015. So I left my job 2011. 2015, I hit six figures and was able to hire my husband out of his job. And he joined the business in 2015. And then we hit multi six figures. Wow. And we've been a multi six figure business for the last five years. And now I've got like 32 books, but I also have uh, lots of other streams of income, which we can potentially talk about. So it really was a buffer zone of time 
but also of money that allowed me to make that jump, plus a business plan of multiple streams of income and never relying just on one thing. Yeah, it's amazing how similar actually your story is to mine in an odd kind of way. It's just, I followed the path to FI. I had created a small website that had this ridiculous name of richmondsavers.com. Uh, still exists. It still exists. It still exists. Beautiful but, site. Um, Great logo. <laughs> <laughs> but I had proved out to myself that, okay, there's something here. Like you said, you were making $1,000. I was you know, somewhere similar to that. But I knew that if I spent my time, care, and attention on this, all right, maybe it can grow into something. So what I did was the first six months that I was that I had left my job was I created a site called Travel Miles 101 that allowed me to scale that concept that I was doing on a very one-on-one -on -one basis. Now, obviously, you're in a completely different sphere, but I'm curious, what did you do when you had all this time, right? You didn't have to just right and do your podcast in the evenings anymore. You have the whole day. Like what did that first six months to a year that you had carved out as, okay, this is my experimentation to see, can I do this? What did that look like? And because that question is so wide open, you mentioned how you were immediately able to start bringing in multiple income streams, including speaking. Nobody, the whole point is nobody knows who you are, right? I mean, how are you able to do this? Okay, I think that the time thing is a big deal because it's one thing that writers ask all the time. It's how do you have time to write and also run a business? Like this management of time is huge. Actually, what I ended up doing, because you're exactly right, like day one, sitting at home going, uh, what do I do? So what I actually did was I commuted to a library. <laughs> so I went used to work at the London Library, which is in the centre of London, because I couldn't cope with being at home with no structure. And that first year, I think you have to learn your structure. And the structure I set then is still valid now in that in the mornings, I actually now like where I live now in Bath in the southwest of England, I will walk 20 minutes to a writing cafe. It's a cafe but I write there. Uh, and then they don't I, know they're a writing cafe, <laughs> but they are. I think they, they do because it's full of laptops these days, you know, 7am, all the laptops are there. So I do my writing for a couple of hours. I, you know, go do some exercise. I come back, have my lunch and then I'm in business mode. I do the business in the afternoon, podcasts and businessy things. So that's kind of how I've always managed my time. And what happens, I think, after a year is that you realize what your, your methods are and you can experiment a bit. But I really think, especially in that first year, you have to set clear boundaries for what you're going to do. And I'm very goal driven. I didn't have a problem with the amount of work I had to do. I just had an issue with suddenly having no one around me. So at the writing cafe, I wear noise cancelling headphones and I'm surrounded by other people, but I can't hear them. And it's it's kind of bliss. So I still do that method. And I, I, I think that everyone should have a similar practice in that your creative time should be separate to your marketing time and your business time, because otherwise you can really get in your own way. You're like, oh, should I write this? Because it might not make any money. And I've written plenty of those books, <laughs> to be sure. Yeah, the, right. the, they say work on your business, not in it. When you're bootstrapping on day one, you don't really have that luxury. So what you just pointed out, the differentiation between the two, work in it here, get it done, creative, work on it here, business, developing, again, multiple income streams. I'm really curious, you know, again, you only sold 100 copies of that book, but somehow you figured out how to make the economics work, how to bring in a paycheck created speaking opportunities, et cetera. And you've said multiple income streams. I want to talk about when you don't even have your first book published yet, or maybe you just have it published. How are we generating multiple income streams? What did that look like for you when you're moving out of working in it to on it? Okay. So one of my major income streams is affiliate income. I know this is something all online entrepreneurs think about. So from day one, anything that I link to say on Amazon, I used an Amazon affiliate link. Even when my blog had like 12 people coming to, <laughs> I always intended to make a good living at this. So I designed the website from day one to have marketing potential. So I did a course the same year I did a book, I also did an online course. So again, this was really early on. This was before it was easy to do this stuff. Uh, I used to sell things on eJunkie. Uh, if you guys, I think it's still around, but you know, not many people use it anymore. So I was selling courses. I was basically getting traffic from America. That's why I love Americans, because there's a lot more online business that started in the US. Obviously, there is more now in the UK and Australia and Canada, but you guys, you pioneered this market. And I was able 
able to essentially I was doing Skype consulting with American authors. So, you know, just over Skype for sort of ninety nine dollars an hour. And over time, I put that rate up um, the speaking. I actually started doing my own workshops. So, again, you don't necessarily need to have anyone hire you. It's uh, I would work in the local library again. I would hire a room in the library. I would just this was back in the day when you would put stuff on uh, LinkedIn. I think I would used LinkedIn back in those days to find people to come to the workshop on self-publishing, for example, or writing a book. So I just went out there and did it and then designed the multiple streams. So they are book sales and we can go into all the different kinds of book sales, but then affiliate income, course sales. So online courses, I now use Teachable, which I think is fantastic. The podcast. So the podcast I started monetizing around 2015, added Patreon, added advertisers and also my own streams of revenue from the podcast. And I also do professional speaking. So I still do that around the world when there's places I want to speak. So those are my main streams of income. But the point is, I designed the website and the business from day one to make money. And over time, obviously, the more traffic you have, the more things like affiliate revenue grow. So that is my totally scalable form of income. Well, and one of the things I've noticed is that having the multiple streams around the website, we have a lot of people that I've met in the FI community where they find FI. They're like, I want to tell the world about it. I'm going to start a blog. And I noticed that some of them really drop off after that six month, one year mark because they're not getting that affiliate income. They're not getting the ad income. How long did it really take to start to see material traffic where you were able to make that income? Because I think that's going to help some of those people in our community who are trying to start something and they're five weeks in and they're like, why haven't I made $100,000 yet? I don't know. (laughs) Five weeks in. Yeah. And this is with podcasting. Oh my goodness. I've been podcasting for over a decade. (laughs) And, you know, people just like, oh, why isn't it working yet? So basically it took uh, at least the five years, even after the five years, as I said, I was still only making a thousand dollars a month from everything. And then a couple of things happened. The self-publishing industry changed. There were more people searching for self-publishing. So around 2015, 2016, it became not bad anymore. Like it used to be, there was a bit of a stigma about it. And then suddenly it became trendy, Uh, a bit like financial independence and talking about spreadsheets and money. Like suddenly it's trendy and everyone's talking about it. So that's what happened. So I got massive influx of traffic and the revenue doubled, doubled, doubled three years in a row. But I was positioned for it because I was one of the first in the space very early. Now, if you're starting out, what you have to do is think you can't necessarily be early in a niche. uh, And if you are, you have to go through years of the wilderness. (laughs) But if you're coming in now, then you have to think about, well, where can I fit in this niche? And what are people searching for? Like, it's still a big deal. Organic Google search or search on a podcast app. Like there is some things you need to do to engineer your website, your podcast to get traffic. And you have to learn those skills. You don't know those skills. So you have to learn them in order that you get traffic. People aren't just going to turn up. You also have to network. And that takes potentially years to position yourself where things can happen. And you hear like like our, our situation, you know, suddenly kind of hearing about each other and and it all working out lovely. This is the thing. It takes time. So the main thing is don't do it for the money. I didn't necessarily know that this is where I was going to end up. And I almost gave up the podcast in 2015 because it was taking so much time. You know, it takes a lot of time to do a podcast. And I was doing everything, the transcript, the show notes, the editing, everything. And so I was like, should I give it up? Should I give it up? And I was like, no, I'm going to make it pay. <laughs> so <laughs> You just have to change your mindset. That's awesome. Yeah, that, I think that's hugely helpful for people. And also, there is something to be said for like the greatest rewards are delayed. You know, it's, it's, you got to stay in the game long enough to get 1% better and allow that 1% aggregation to really start to work for you. I want to actually kind of pivot and really kind of give both of you an opportunity to have this conversation with our audience. I think it's gonna be valuable. And I want to talk about when you decided that you wanted to hop into a new business, you realized that you wanted to move into intellectual property. And after you kind of went through your checklist of the pros and cons, location independence, I want to be able to work on my terms. And you kind of landed on this desire that you had to be an author and to start writing your own books. And so I wanted to actually talk about what you chose to write about because 32 books, that's probably not 32 books on how to write a book, right? I mean, I want to talk about how you picked your topic. Did you limit yourself to one niche? And then maybe the, and MK, you can weigh in here too, like the benefits of being a writer 
in terms of, you know, royalties forever, et cetera, um, on terms of as an income stream. So I'd love to kind of give you the floor and maybe start with, you know, how did you pick what you were going to write about after your one big idea, your first book? Mm. Well, I think like many people, you know, you do something and then you want to share it with everyone else. So basically I did that first book on career change and then I wanted to tell people about self-publishing. <laughs> so I started the blog about it, the podcast about it, and I started writing books to help other people. So early on, I did sort of how to market a book, which is on its third edition and how to make a living with your writing and business for authors. And so I started writing to the author niche. So in that way, those books are kind of written to market. And I've got like 11 books now for authors. But at the same time, my creative side really also wanted to do fiction. So I started writing fiction in 2009 and this was never for the money. And to be fair, it's still not really for the <laughs> money because fiction is really hard. <laughs> so I started writing thrillers in 2009, published the first one in 2011, and now I've got 17, 18 plus some others under other names. <laughs> So I really have a mix of fiction and nonfiction. And this helps in many ways because I can talk about all the things that fiction writers go through. I do make revenue from fiction, but not even not I'm not a six figure fiction author. I make over six figures from book sales, but not from fiction alone. But it's all wonderful. And it helps me with the create different kinds of creativity. I think that's probably the best way. But in terms of intellectual property assets, this is a huge mindset shift between people who uh, want a publishing deal because they think that's the only way for validation versus people who understand that the value of intellectual property and copyright, which is it can earn you money for, 50, for your whole lifetime and then 50 to 70 years after you die. So you can actually put that in a trust. You can pass it on to your estate. Obviously, it needs managing, like any property, a physical property also needs managing. But essentially, it's something that is not, uh, doesn't die <laughs> even when you do, which is kind of magical. And then also, you can do so many things with it. So a book is not just one book. So you can see behind me in the video some of my books, but they exist in, say, ebooks uh, all over the world in, in all these different places. They exist as paperbacks, hardbacks, large print editions. I know MK has a workbook um, as well, a workbook edition, also audio books, all these things that you can do. So you can make multiple streams of income from one book, plus you can license in different territories, plus you can license in different languages. It's almost, you know, there's so many. Plus then you can do films, TV, you can do a play, you can do like it's unlimited number of IP variations that you can get from a book. So that's why I think it's so incredible. When the penny drops around this, you realize, oh my goodness, that's why publishers are in the middle of New York in their big buildings, <laughs> because they are not charities. They want to make money and your book will help them make money. And since I'm a businesswoman, I like making money. So hence why I like keeping control of my intellectual property assets. Yes, license it when applicable. For example, I just licensed to Korea. I've got uh, another deal in Greek underway. So you do these things, but controlling your intellectual property assets is probably the key to making a good living as a as an author. MK, I see you nodding. I <laughs> see, see the pure joy coming out of both of you as all these ideas are being expressed. What are your thoughts and feedback on that? I mean, amen. Amen. <laughs> um, and that's one of the things that's been really big on my journey this past year. You know, I've I started publishing in 2015. I just left the corporate job this past year. I'm in the dip right now. I I left my high self-esteem, high paying job to now be just another author. And I was talking with my husband and I said, you know what, next year I'm going to make back my salary. And the next year I'm six figures and the next and the next. And he was like, how about you just focus on making enough passive income with your royalties to meet our annual expenses? And I was like, that sounds better <laughs> because that's all I need. And knowing the power of these different assets and really I had to reframe my books instead of just as my art, which they are thinking of them as these passive income vehicles, just like our index funds are passive income vehicles, just like when we had our rental property, that was a passive income vehicle and realizing the priority that that can have in your life and not wanting to sign it away to somebody else, because that's something where we talk about generational financial independence or second generation FI. If I do a good enough job, my heirs will be enjoying the benefits of my labor 
into the next generation after I'm gone. And that's a legacy I can give them just like I could passing down a Roth or any of those other vehicles. No, that's fantastic. I do want to say, I don't think books are passive. Um, I mean, I have index fund investments, but with books, you have to manage your IP in the same way that we have to manage our websites, our podcasts. I have to manage my books. I have to do some kind of marketing. They, w- I've said to my husband, if I died, it probably, w- well, of course I'm going to die. <laughs> but if I died early, it would probably take about two years for things to spiral downwards without some management. So you have to think about how your estate might manage your IP. But we see some incredible IP estates being managed. So Tolkien is obviously a really good one. We just got Amazon now licensed again. Bram Stoker with Dracula. I mean, there are some great estates out there. Beatrix Potter in the UK basically gave all of her money to buy the Lake District uh, here, which uh, is this beautiful area that she bought with her money because she was child free, as am I by choice. And she basically bought this for the the British people. So you can do very exciting things with your IP and your estate. But I definitely think you do need to manage it more than, say, uh, passive index funds. And Joanna, I'm curious about that. So what do your activities look like? I don't know if we'll call them marketing activities or whatever, but what does that look like to actively manage this? And I guess kind of similar or slash related is you have 32 books. I'm assuming there's some type of 80-20 on which ones produce a significant amount of revenue. You said your 17 or 18 fiction are probably not producing, you know, or not as, as, uh, significant as the other nonfiction, but I, I'd love to hear like how you think about it as a business. Are there network effects of having 32 books and then a 33rd? How does this all come together in an overall strategy? As you said, I'm a businesswoman. How do you think about your entire business like that with these books? Mm. It's an ecosystem. And you're exactly right. Uh, Each book is used in a different way. So for example, I've got a book, Successful Self-Publishing, which is like in its fifth edition. That is a free ebook on all platforms all around the world. And part of it is, yay, I like to help people. The other part is it's chock full of affiliate links. So I market that book as much as possible and I will pay to market it because it brings in far more money than it would as a book sale as a 99 cent ebook. So that would be one uh, one example versus at the other end of the scale, I've got 10 books in my arcane thriller series. I know that each individual one of those books doesn't make that much money. But if people get into the series and they buy all of them and I'm about to do book 11, then I'll make that money all the way through the series. And I can do box sets of those. I can do different things. So with fiction, the more books you have, definitely the more money you make. With nonfiction, it's more about how strategic is the book and how many streams of revenue come off the book. So, for example, I've got a book, How to Write Nonfiction, which also has a course associated with it. And then in terms of marketing, Marketing, something like the podcast, you guys know the podcast is both marketing for you, your brand, your books, your business, but it can also be revenue generating in that you can do indirect sales through with your products and stuff, but you can also have advertisers, you can have Patreon. I have a wonderful Patreon community who is super supportive. So all of the, I think about the best marketing is that which also makes money, which also helps people and also sells books. So I think about it as very much an ecosystem. And I've actually recently started doing this for my fiction. I've started another podcast called Books and Travel, which is around talking to fiction authors about the places that inspire their books, which also markets my fiction. Because I've seen this work so well with my nonfiction, I'm like, right, I'm going to do this for my fiction. I don't want to rely on just paid advertising, which, you know, Amazon ads, Facebook ads, I, I don't like that form of advertising very much. You know, as we set up in this episode, we actually have this opportunity here to have two independent authors and give you the chance to talk with each other and really do so for the benefit of thousands and thousands of authors that are in our community or aspiring authors, at least. And I just want to give you the floor. MK, what questions do you have for Joanna? Well, I was taking notes because I'm starting to work on, I'm going, she went from nonfiction to fiction. I'm about to go from fiction to nonfiction. And so I was excited to get some ideas as well. And so for the person who's listening right now, who is at book zero, they are saying, okay, I'm inspired. I'm going to do it. What would be your biggest advice for them to start out? They don't have an ecosystem yet. They don't have the affiliate link set up yet. What would be your number one piece of advice for them as they're getting started? Okay. So really it's schedule time. 
So if you've decided that this is important to you, that you're going to write that book, then get out your calendar, however you schedule your time and put in time blocks. And they need to, it doesn't need to be every day. It doesn't, you don't need to be Stephen King here, but you can like at least let's say a couple of times a week. Uh, like I used to get up at 5 a.m. You know, whatever you can do uh, after the kids are gone to bed, whatever you can do, put it in your diary and then turn up for that appointment and use that time for writing. Seriously, it's the only way you will ever write a book. And in fact, it's the, probably the only way you're ever going to achieve whatever you want to achieve, but especially for writing, because there's always something else. And, and the problem with writing is that, yes, you turn up for the page. So you're there. And then you're like, oh, what do I do? Uh, big tip, do not try and start with the introduction or the first chapter. It's just impossible. Don't even go there. <laughs> start wherever. It doesn't matter. Just get going. I actually used um, a place called writeordie.com when I first started, which is basically you start typing and if you if you slow down, it starts going red and then there's kamikaze mode. It will start deleting your work. Oh. I mean, it's really, really scary. <laughs> but it got me writing because I was so scared of like the blank page. So you have to force yourself to the page and then and sit there for let's say 25 minutes 20 minutes half an hour whatever and write and it, yes it will be a pile of crap it will that's okay <laughs> it needs to be so that you can you can you know make it better later edit it later but if you don't make that time you'll never end up with that first draft and if you don't have a first draft you'll never be able to edit it into a book and the guys know with the choose fi book and you know mk with your books that's the process you don't sit down and write perfect prose you sit down and write a mess and you tidy it up later so that's the first step. It really is schedule your time. Absolutely. I'll, yeah, I'll second that any day. What, what, you just said one tip and I'm like, really? We could do two or three <laughs> tips. What would be your next tip? Okay. My next tip is to decide what you want because, and this is a huge, huge deal, right? Because let's say you want to win uh, the Pulitzer Prize, which is a great goal, <laughs> then uh, you will probably write a very, very different book to someone who, you know, wants to write a vampire fiction novel and sell as many books as Anne Rice, for example. Or if you really want a traditional publishing deal and you want to be a speaker, that is completely different, again, to somebody who has a podcast and is writing a book for their business, like you guys, or someone doing the Phiology uh, workbook there, which of course uh, MK has, that's right, isn't it? Phiology, the workbook. That book, you know, you're not going to win the Pulitzer Prize with the Phiology workbook, but you are going to make some income and you're going to help your community. So that's the second question. What do I really want? Because the most disappointed authors are the ones who just write stuff. And then later they're like, well, why didn't that happen? You know, why didn't I get a book deal or why didn't I achieve what I wanted? Well, it's probably because you didn't decide what you wanted. And I always decided to make six figures. I always wanted to be a wealthy author. So thus. And uh, that's you know, not wrong. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah. You know, to Joanna's point about making the time, you have to sit down and write the words. It takes time. Um, you know, I say that some things move at the speed of literature. It's a very slow pace. And that if you are sitting here thinking, you know, I want a side hustle, I've heard that writing books is a good way to do it. I would suggest a different side hustle to make some quick money because, you know, it does take that time. You really do have to know what you want going into it. And if it is that you want to create this art, you want to create this beautiful story, this masterpiece, you probably have to be okay with the fact that you're not going to make a lot of money versus if you're writing to make a lot of money, it's very different. Um, and there are lots of exceptions to the rules that people can point out. Well, so-and-so made this masterpiece and they made millions of dollars. Well, that's the exception to the rule. And I would let people know that if you, it's okay to want to make art and make money, but you do have to decide which one is going to be your priority. And that was something I struggled with for a while. And that fear of success that people would think I was a sellout. And then I realized nobody cares. <laughs> so I could oh, have both. The other thing I would say is that you can do one for money, one for art. That's why I joked about my fiction. And I mean, some of my books really just don't sell anything at all. But I wrote them because that was the book I needed to write. And that's how I still run things. It's like, you know, I'm my next book is audio for authors. And the one after that will be Map of the Impossible, which is my third fantasy in a trilogy. I don't know whether that will sell any copies, but it doesn't matter because I'm finishing that book. <laughs> You know, and Joanna, there's something here with the way that you approach building your community and creating this resource for independent authors that I know MK has found so valuable. If you think about 
what it is that you did. It doesn't sound like it was writing fiction books and all the independent authors found out about you. And because of how awesome you were at writing fiction books, they were there, you know, that, that kind of came later. And so I'm thinking, regardless of whether or not we're talking about writing, that we're just pick a niche, any niche, whatever that is, your woodworking, whatever. What do you think it looks like to create a captive community, a community that just loves what you do and acts as ambassadors for what you do that almost ensures that it's going places, right? You guys are going somewhere together. If you think back, what did it look like to build that? What comes to mind? Well, it literally is that I am the community. <laughs> it was day one. Oh my goodness. Like if you look at my YouTube channel from 2007, it's like, wow, look at this. I got a book. I got my Kindle. I got, I'm doing this. this I get so excited. I'm still there. I'm still planning six, eight months ahead with my content after over a decade because I am the community <laughs> and it doesn't stop. And I'm always writing. I'm always marketing. I'm always learning, always doing new things. And I have just literally shared my journey. And so the biggest tip is it has to be a community you're in. It has to be a niche you love in order for it to be sustainable. And also, you know, those five, ye five years, seven years of no money <laughs> didn't matter because this was a community I love and won't be, even if I win the lottery, of course, I don't play the lottery, but you know what I mean? Even if I reach five, I'm not giving giving this up. This is what I do until the day I die. So I think that's the key. The key is if you're learning something that you love, then you want to share it. Hence, you know, the FI community is the same. People are like, oh, I, I've just, I've made this thing. Now I'm going to tell people. It's the same with the Choose FI show, right? Everybody wants to share what they've learned in order to help others. And my nonfiction books literally just come out of people asking me questions. And I'm like, oh, I guess I need a book on that. So I can, you know, those people can just get everything all at once, rather than having to comb through my backlist of my podcasts and all of that kind of thing. So it really is just creating from the community that you are embedded in. And Joanna, you have built this amazing community. You've built an amazing business. You have multiple streams of income. But obviously, as we said at the outset, you're in the FI community. You're on the path to FI. I'm curious, what does that look like to you? Do you see a transition in your business? You have multiple streams of income, but these are not passive. Are there aspects that you could see outsourcing or not doing on your, as you get closer to FI, once you reach FI? Like, talk me through what a transition might look like if there is going to be one. Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, just on the path to fire, it was 2015 again when I hit six figures and it was like, OK, I need to get investing. You know, we'd, I'd hit the goal that I wanted to. And that's when we started putting money into ISAs and SIPs, which are the UK equivalent of your stuff. And Tony Robbins put out Money Master the Game, which is where I discovered Vanguard funds and that type of thing. So I've been doing it since then. And I have been thinking about it because where we are now, we're about a quarter five, according to my numbers. But of course, I'll never give up what I do creatively. What I will give up are things like webinars on my evening. So because of the time difference between the UK and America, I often have to do things late in the evening and I'm a morning person. And I'm like, I would totally give that up the moment <laughs> I can. The other thing is some of that paid advertising I mentioned, it's a necessary evil in our day and age to be discovered, to have your books discovered, uh, to do this type of thing and to learn advertising and that kind of thing. I will just stop all of that. And again, not worry at all how many books I sell. I mean, I, I don't worry too much about it, but you know, I will definitely care less about that. And I will write more of the books of my heart. Um, although I think I'm almost coming to the end of some of my books for authors. I've almost written every single book for authors possible. But those are, I guess, some of the things. But what I, I really question the Creative Pen podcast. Every time I think, oh, I think maybe I've shared everything possible. And then it's like, no, I'm still going. So I'm going to carry on. <laughs> MK is but, like um, off camera right yeah. now saying, don't you dare yeah, stop it. Furiously <laughs> shaking her head. Please do not do that. <laughs> but that's actually why Patreon is so good because Patreon to me is an emotional support. It's people who actively say, we don't want you to stop. And it means so much to me. The money I get from Patreon is, it means like 10 times as much for some weird reason than the money I might get from other income streams like a webinar because it's people who are emotionally invested in my body of work. And this is another thing. The podcast is a creative body body of work. And I hope you guys feel that too, because it can change people's lives. It doesn't have to be the book that changes people's lives. It can be the podcast or speaking or whatever. So all of these things go together. And so when I think about what I give up, it's more that what will I create? So 
Books and Travel, the new podcast, um, which is I have a five year plan for that as a business. And eventually I'll do tours and retreats and that kind of thing. That doesn't make money right now, but I intend it to. And then maybe at some point I'll wind one thing down and wind another thing up. But it will be more about the creating different things than necessarily giving stuff up. All right. Well, this has been fun. On most shows, that would be the end of the episode. But Joanna, on this show, we would love to give you the chance to tackle the hot seat. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation, these questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. All right, Joanna, question number one, I'm going to change this up a little bit. What is your favorite book of all time? Ooh, yeah. So. <laughs> that is just, it is just so hard. <laughs> so I'm, I'm actually going to pick to The Stand by Stephen King, which is, <laughs> MK also likes The Stand by Stephen King. Um, <laughs> She's pumping her dystopia. fists here. <laughs> MK, are you fangirling oh, right now? I feel like this is, there's something going on over here. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen King and Joanna Penn for MK, I think. Uh, mm. I so totally great. love him. <laughs> Yeah. He's so great. Well, he's in Sarasota. So I was like, I feel like today, cause I'm getting to talk to you. I'm probably going to walk outside and just see him and I'll be like, okay, I'm done. I'm good. <laughs> that would be amazing. I'm hoping that'll happen, but <laughs> it probably won't. But I also, I did also want to say that I have created a list of money books because when we did the podcast together, I made a, a list at thecreativepen.com forward slash money books. And of course, the Choose FI book is there. But because I'm such a book person, I could not pick one book. So I picked about 25. Nice. <laughs> and they're all on that, that page. <laughs> My second book is The Success Principles by Jack Canfield, which I read when I didn't know what to do with my life. Jack Canfield's fantastic. And the, one of the first principles is take 100% responsibility for your life. And if you feel like you're in a place where you're like, how did I get here? Well, you're there because you made choices to get there. And the only way to get to where you want to be is by making choices to get to where you want to be. And that is exactly the same with becoming an author, changing your career, reaching FI. It's all the same. You, you set the goal of where you want to get to and then take those little steps. So the success principles by Jack Canfield. Well, that actually sets us up really well for question number two. With all the changes that you just mentioned, an inflection point in your life that was especially memorable or meaningful. Oh, well, we, we've talked about quite a lot, actually. So I'm going to pick uh, a different one, which is when I left the UK in the year 2000 to go backpacking. And this was probably the big decision. I thought at that point I was opting out of my career. So this was, I was 25. It was my birthday, the year 2000. I was like, I am out of here, out of London, out of the rat race. I am giving it up and I'm finding myself in the Australian outback. <laughs> and wow. I did find a lot in the Australian outback, but I did end up going back to the job. But I believe that moment when I gave up the job in London, the city, the suits and all of that, that was the first time I gave it up, but it was the first inkling that I would make that decision again and again and again until I actually made it out. <laughs> That's amazing. All right, Joanna, question number three, your favorite life hack? Uh, Google Calendar, which ties back into the decision uh, discussion earlier on, on tips because I schedule everything. And this might be sad. Like I schedule things like, oh, there's a TV show coming out on Netflix. Oh, That's wow. I schedule, <laughs> <laughs> I schedule um, books. So I know when there's a book coming out that I'm really looking forward to. I schedule time with my husband. We have a shared calendar. I schedule everything. I mean, realistic, like, like I schedule my time at the writing cafe. Everything is scheduled because if you don't organize it, you're just not going to get it done. Thus, I also block out big chunks of creative time in my schedule. But that is my life hack. Google Calendar. There you go. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you my uh, blocked out calendar offline. But I, I have a calendar on Google. It's a template called Make Time. Uh, and uh, there's a fantastic book that we're going to talk with them later uh, by author John Zaraski and Jake Knapp uh, with a similar title. Yeah. And uh, that idea of scheduling yourself really is crucial. All right, Joanna, question number four, your biggest financial mistake. It literally is being scared of financial education. So I'm incredibly educated. Uh, you know, I went to Oxford, don't you know? I love that <laughs> and, you just said that. That's like the best <laughs> sentence ever. <laughs> don't you know? <laughs> don't you know? Well, the reason is because 
the Rich Dad Poor Dad book is written exactly for people like me, over-educated in lots of ways, but with no clue about financial education. My, my parents were teachers. We didn't have money growing up. So basically, I just didn't know about this stuff. I was told, you know, get a good degree, get a job pay the money and someone will give you a pension because that's what my parents knew. They're boomers. They got the pension from the government. (laughs) But that's not the reality. So for me, my biggest mistake was just not learning. And I had this corporate job and I didn't pay anything into any investments because I was scared of even talking about it because it made me look stupid. And I was stupid. I was ignorant of finance. And so I went, oh, I don't need that because I don't understand it. And I would get upset because I didn't understand it. So I just didn't do it. And Mm. goodness me, the amount of money (laughs) that has just uh, disappeared because I didn't invest at that point. And in Britain, we we don't, well, we didn't at the time have mandatory investments. Uh, when I was in Australia, luckily, they have mandatory super. So I actually have money because, you know, the government made it come out of my bank account. But I just, I, years lost of revenue from investing. So that would be my biggest issue is why did I not learn about this stuff and face up to finance earlier in my life? And realistically, so I was like 35 when and I really got to grips with it. And now I'm 45 this year. So I'm into it. But and I know you've talked about is it too late on the show? I have felt that be like, seriously, but then also I know from Kiyosaki starting a business is a really good way to scale up your revenue. And then you can invest more. So that's my secret weapon is having a business where I just make more and more cash. Pretty solid secret weapon. We could talk about that more. Uh, question number five, the advice you would give your younger self. Oh, well, that's kind of related. I'd be like, read, read the damn book. <laughs> <laughs> and and open, you know, open an investment account, just take the money from the company and put it in the account, you know, at least do the basics. So I think that's the thing, like even doing the basics, I didn't even do that. So that would be the advice to my younger self. Don't be afraid of it. And that bias for action, I should have had a bias of action to, I always made loads of money. I was good. I am good at making money. I just didn't know how to keep it. And that was the thing It's that that leaky bucket idea. So yeah, I, sh- I should have done that earlier. Joanna, we have a bonus question for you. What is the purchase you've made in let's say the last 12 months or so that has added the most value to your life? I'm actually really happy for this question because this is changing up completely Ooh. in that it is my personal trainer for weights. So basically I've had, uh, the you know, writers, we have this kind of hunched position. And I found after doing being a desk jockey for like half my life, I ended up with chronic pain in both my shoulders, actually bad RSI, all kinds of health issues. And eventually I managed to sort of make the decision to invest in weight training and one-on-one training. And I ended 2019 pain-free. So my shoulder is rehabbed. I am now lifting serious weights as a, a woman at midlife. And I'm very proud of that. And so this is the thing, how it ties into Choose FI. Um, you know, independence is not just about money. It's also about health. <laughs> Wealth is physical health. And I seriously, I feel healthier than I have in years. So it's a purchase that I spend every single week, twice a week, is on a personal trainer to help me with my physical strength. And it is the best thing I've done in so many years. Uh, so I would say it's an investment in my life, my happiness, my health, uh, and my future. So that is well recommended. If you're listening and you have any kind of chronic pain and you're a writer, it is very normal and you have to deal with it. It's <laughs> fantastic. All right, Joanna, people are listening to this and they want to connect with you. They want to connect with their content. They just want to find out more. What is the best way for someone to find out more? Come on over to The Creative Pen with a double N and there is the podcast and all the books and everything. And I'm on Twitter at The Creative Pen. Joanna, thank you for joining us on the show today. Thanks so much for having me. It's hard to imagine that if you're an aspiring creative, you did not get value from this episode. If you're someone that is saying, you know, I want to be more than just what I do. I want to, I want to invest myself in what can I create and how can I create a living off of that? Then this episode was for you. Not only should you listen to this, like, comment, subscribe on your platform that you may be listening to this on, whether it's a podcast or YouTube, but you may know someone else that needs to hear this. Share this with a friend. If you got value from today's episode and you want to support us here at Choose FI, here are three easy ways. One, if you want to travel the world with miles and points instead of your hard-earned dollars, then just go to choosefi.com slash travel to take our free course on travel rewards. Two, check out our book, 
Chooseify, your blueprint to financial independence can be found anywhere that books are found. It is by far the most digestible and linear way to actually incorporate a comprehensive approach to financial independence into your life. If you've already got this locked down and you don't need one for your own bookshelf, get it for a friend or request that your local library pick it up so there's a copy for your community. And three, and really most importantly, Find your friends, your coworkers, and your family members that might be open to this message and tell them about the podcast. Have them start at episode 100, which we consider our gateway episode, or simply go to chooseify.com slash start. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.